Hello everyone, this is John Hashmet and welcome to Physics Simply. In this video, I will be solving the Paper 2 exam for February, March 2020. So let's get started. Question 1 says the diagram shows a rectangular metal sheet close to two rulers. Uh, what is the area of the metal sheet? So we need the length and the width of the sheet. So this is pointing to 5, this is pointing to 25. So we have a length of 20 centimeters. And this part is pointing towards the 10 mark, and this is 45, so we have here 35. So we calculate the area by multiplying 20 by 35. This gives us 700 centimeter cubed, so the answer is A. Question 2 says a ball falls from rest through the air towards the ground. The diagram shows two forces acting on the ball. We have air resistance and the gravitational force. As the ball falls, air resistance increases because as speed increases, air resistance increases. And we have several statements. Which statement is correct? Uh, the acceleration of the ball is decreasing or is it increasing? The speed of the ball decreases. This is wrong uh, because we have a resultant force uh, downwards since the gravitational force is greater now than the air resistance. So speed should be increasing. And the gravitational force uh, on the ball decreases this is not correct. Uh, if you're going closer to a planet, you either will experience uh, an increasing gravitation force if the distance is great, or for this case, the gravitation force should be constant, which is mg, and mass and gravitation field on the surface are constant. So we have either this or that. So we calculate the resultant force in this case using the weight minus air resistance. And the air resistance is increasing. So the negative part of the resultant force is increasing. This causes the resultant force to decrease. And acceleration is proportional to the resultant force. So as the resultant force decreases, acceleration also decreases. So the answer is A. Question 3 says a compressed spring projects a ball horizontally in a vacuum chamber. On the earth, the ball reaches the chamber floor four meters in front of the spring so we have something that went like this and this distance is four meters in a vacuum uh, an identical experiment is done on the moon the gravitational field strength is lower on the moon than on the earth so it would take longer time to reach the floor because the gravity is weaker so it's expected to move a further distance away because it will take uh, a longer time moving downwards the experiment results uh, on the moon are compared with those on the earth which statement is correct the horizontal speed is greater this is false because it said in the question that we made an identical experiment so we pushed it with the same velocity at first the horizontal speed is the same this is correct this is correct on the moon and the ball hits the floor four meters in front of the spring no because that would be the same as before since we will take a longer time, it, uh, the ball will move horizontally a longer distance, more than 4 meters in front of the spring. So the answer is D. Question 4 says, Diagram 1 shows a piece of flexible material that contains many pockets of air. Diagram 2 shows the same piece of flexible material after it has been compressed so that its volume decreases. What happens to the mass and weight of the flexible material itself? The material itself did not change, so the mass did not change. And the weight is calculated mg, and g did not change, so no change to weight either. So the answer is D. Question 5 says, the graph shows how the strength of the Earth's gravity field varies as the distance from the Earth's surface increases. As you go further away from the planet, the gravitational field strength due to the planet decreases. The value G keeps decreasing. Which row describes the effect uh, that this has on the mass and on the weight of an object as it moves further away from the Earth's surface? The mass is always unchanged but the weight depends on g and g is decreasing so the weight is also decreasing so the answer is c question six says a measuring cylinder contains 40 centimeter cubed of water a solid metal ball is dropped into the water and the water level rises to 56 centimeter cubed 
the mass of the ball itself is 80 grams what is the density of the metal from which the ball is made so we have density equals mass over volume but here we have the mass is 80 and the volume is the difference between the two volumes the initial and final volumes that's 56 minus 40 this calculation gives us 5 grams per centimeter cubed which is d question 7 says a car travels along a horizontal road at constant speed three horizontal forces acting on the car the diagram shows two of these forces uh, what is the size and the direction of the third force acting on the car and it said you are moving with constant speed so the forward forces must be equal to the backward forces this means we need an extra force backward to compensate for the 1500 uh, let's call it x so we have 300 plus x should be equal to 1500 then we subtract the 300 from the 500 we get 1200 and it's backwards so the answer is a question 8 says a car is driving around a bend in the road at a constant speed what is the direction of the resultant force on the car when it is going around the bend the resultant force uh, on any object moving in a circular path or a curved path is towards the center of the circle or perpendicular to the velocity so we have parallel to the motion parallel to the motion this is wrong perpendicular to the motion yes towards the inside of the bend or outside of the bend inside of the bend that's towards the center so the answer is c question 9 says an athlete with mass 70 kilograms trains by performing press ups with a load on his back the diagram shows the perpendicular distances involved the center of mass of the athlete is cm and the center of mass of the load he is carrying is cl so the weight of the athlete himself is pointing this way from point cm and the weight of the load is pointing this way from cl and we have the masses we have the mass of the athlete 70 kilograms so his weight is 70 times 9.8 of course in this year uh, the value of g was taken to be 10 we will use a 9.8 for the new syllabus and the mass of the load is 6 kilograms so the weight of the load is 6 times 9.8 and we will consider that this person is acting as a rod and is pivoted around his foot at this point so this is a pivot and we have this force is performing an anti-clockwise moment and this force is performing an anti-clockwise moment what is the upward force exerted by his two arms so we have an upward force here from the ground and we want to calculate this force so this is the only one creating a clockwise moment around the pivot and we can say that clockwise moments are equal to anti-clockwise moments since the person is not rotating right now so the clockwise moment is f times the perpendicular distance from the force to the pivot which means all these values added together which gives a distance of 1.4 meters and the anti-clockwise moments we need to have two brackets the first bracket containing the first force which is 6 times 9.8 multiplied by the distance from this part to the pivot so 0.1 plus 0.3 this gives us a distance of 1.2 and another anti-clockwise moment which is 70 times 9.81 as a force multiplied by the distance from the force to the pivot which is 0.9 meters we must calculate the distance from the force to the pivot so we add the right hand side then we divide by 1.4 this gives a value for the force of 529.2 newton but this is using the value for g as 9.8 uh, so we will pick the closest one to that number which is c so if we used g uh, is equal to 10 we would get an answer equal to 540 newtons Question 10 says an air pistol fires a pellet forward. What is the motion of the air pistol? So when you fire something forward, you are pushed backward as a reaction. So we will say backwards, backwards with a speed greater or less than. This is uh, depending on 
the rules of momentum or the conservation of momentum. So we have the initial momenta of the pistol and the pellet to be zero because everything was at rest. And after the explosion, we have M1 V1 minus M2 V2 because we have opposite directions here. So the magnitude of M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. So as mass increases, the velocity must decrease. So you get a total value of mass times velocity equal in both situations. Of course, the rifle or the pistol is much heavier than the pellet. So it would have the smaller speed. So less than the pellet. So the answer is B. Question 11 says, which row describes an advantage and a disadvantage of wind turbines? Uh, no fuel needed. This is an advantage. Variable supply. This is not an advantage, but it is true about wind turbines. No harmful gases released. This is an advantage. Constant supply. No, uh, it's a variable supply. Disadvantages. Harmful gas released. No fuel needed. No variable supply. This is a disadvantage and it's noisy. So this is a disadvantage also. So the answer is C. Question 12 says an electric motor provides 900 joules of useful output energy. The efficiency of the motor is 60%. How much electrical energy is supplied to the motor? So the efficiency is calculated as energy output over energy input times 100. So by placing these values in that equation, 60 equals uh, the energy output which was 900 joules over the energy input which is required times 100 if you replace the 60 with the energy input you, uh, you use cross multiplication so we have energy input is equal to 900 times 100 over 60 this gives a value of 1500 joules which is c in this question Question 13 says, a crane takes two minutes to lift a 500 kilogram load to the top of a building that is 12 meters high. So we have mass, we have time, and we have height. What is the useful power developed against gravity by the crane? Power can be calculated either work over time or energy over time. So in this case, we have the type of energy which is gravitational potential energy. So it's mgh over time. We have the mass 500, we have G 9.8, height of 12, and we divide by the time in seconds, so we multiply by 60. This gives a value of 493 joules, and we take the closest number to it, which is C. The next question says, a skier is standing still on a flat area of snow. The weight of the skier is 550 newton. This is force. The total area of his skis in contact with the ground is 0 0.015 meters squared. Uh, what is the pressure exerted on the ground by the skier? Pressure is equal to force over area. So we divide 550 by 0 0.015. This gives a value of 36,666.66666 and so on. So we approximate this. We get 37 thousand newton per meter squared or pascal question 15 says a tall cylinder is partially filled with two liquids which do not mix the two liquids have different densities a student measures the pressure due to the liquids at different depth so we have p q and the level between the two liquids which graph shows how the liquid pressure varies between positions p and q with depth so uh, there was an equation that uh, says P equals rho G H, the density multiplied by gravity acceleration multiplied by the depth. So as depth increases, the pressure increases. So we have uh, all of these are correct except for D. So as depth increases, uh, it is not constant. The pressure is not constant. But since the pressure also depends on density uh, from Q and going up, the depth decreases and we have the higher density below so from p we are moving with low density so the pressure would not rise as much as from uh, starting from liquid q so at first the increase in pressure is low then the increase in pressure is high so uh, this is not correct uh, because the change in pressure was first grade then smaller this is 
the correct value so low rise in pressure then high rise in pressure in the new liquid or the lower liquid which is more dense always uh, the more dense liquids go down and the less dense liquids go up and the change in pressure is not constant because the density is not constant so it is not c so the answer is b question 16 says when pollen grains in water are viewed through a microscope they are seen to be in continuous rapid random motion which causes pollen grains to move in this way convection currents no convection currents has a pattern uh, the hot objects uh, move upwards or the hot fluids move upwards and the cold fluids move down so this is not random bombardment by a single molecule of water not a single molecule of water it's many molecules uh, uneven yes bombardment of different sides by water molecules this is correct also so the answer is c statement d says collisions with another pollen grain no this is not true question 17 says a student measures the mass of warm water in an open container over two minutes the container is kept at constant temperature the results are in the table so as time goes by the mass of the water keeps decreasing why does the mass of the water change is the water evaporating or the water freezing or the water condensing or the water boiling it's evaporating this this is what is causing the loss of water question 18 says which points uh, are the fixed points of the liquid and glass thermometer shown uh, the beginning and the end points no the points marked negative 10 this is, uh, these are also the end and the beginning the points marked 0 and 100 degrees this is the melting point and boiling point of water these are the fixed points by the way this question should not be in the new syllabus so any uh, questions uh, on thermometers you can just skip them in the coming videos question 90 says the specific heat capacities of aluminium iron ethanol and water are given one kilogram of each metal is put into five kilograms of each liquid the starting temperature of each metal is 60 degrees and the starting temperature of each liquid is 10 degrees celsius which example has the highest final temperature is it aluminium with ethanol iron with ethanol or aluminium with water or iron with water there are two approaches to solve this uh, type of question you can think that you could have the highest amount of uh, rise in temperature by choosing a metal that has the highest specific heat capacity so this is a supply of a lot of energy that would cause a large rise in temperature and in the equation q equals mc delta theta the specific heat capacity is inversely proportional to the temperature so since you have a certain supply of energy as c increases the rise in temperature decreases or vice versa so you want a large increase in temperature you need a small specific heat capacity for the liquid by comparing these values you would take the smaller one or you would take just the longer approach which is calculating each final temperature in each example for example by taking uh, the first one you have mc delta theta from the aluminium is equal to mc delta theta for the ethanol the mass of the aluminium was one kilogram the specific heat capacity of aluminium is 900 the change in temperature is 60 minus the final temperature which is required that is equal to the energy uh, gained by the ethanol and the mass of ethanol is 5 multiplied by the specific heat capacity 2400 multiplied by the change in temperature which is theta final temperature minus 10 since the final temperature would be higher than 10 then uh, simplifying this equation we have 900 multiplied by 60 minus 900 multiplied by theta that is equal to 5 multiplied by 2400 multiplied by theta this is all one bracket minus 5 multiplied by 2400 multiplied by 10 this is another bracket now we place all the numbers on one side of the equation and the factors of theta on the other side so we have 900 times 60 in a bracket plus since it was already subtracted on the other side it will be added on the left side the other bracket is 5 times 2400 times 10 
this is equal to 5 times 2400 theta and we add the other one 900 times theta so these factors are added and multiplied by theta then we divide by this value on the other side we divide this whole thing divide by uh, 5 times 2 uh, 2400 plus 900 this would give for the first one an answer of 13.5 for the second one this would give 11.8 for the third one this would give 12 for the fourth one this would give 11 so the highest value is a which had the highest uh, specific heat capacity for the metal which supplies the energy and the lowest specific heat capacity for the liquid which takes the energy so the final temperature would be greater question 20 says metals are good thermal conductors insulators are poor thermal conductors which description of the mechanism of thermal conductivity is correct in insulators conduction takes place by electron transfer no uh, uh, insulators do not have free electrons in insulators conduction takes place by electron transfer also no in metals conduction takes place by electron transfer and molecular vibrations this is correct not only dependent on electron transfer conduction mainly depends on molecular vibrations but in metals it also depends on the transfer of electrons question 21 says a teacher shows his class a polystyrene cup the cup is made from thick plastic with lots of tiny air bubbles in it he asks the class why the cup is so good at keeping a hot drink warm three suggestions are made uh, one it contains air which is a poor thermal conductor two is the air is trapped in tiny bubbles so very little convection is possible three the plastic is a poor thermal conductor which suggestions are correct they are all correct so it's d one two and three question 22 says a boy jumps into an indoor swimming pool he notices that the water appears to get colder as he goes deeper underwater this is due to convection which statement is correct cold water is more dense than warm water so it sinks to the bottom this is actually a true statement but we will read the other ones warm water is more dense this is not correct uh, the molecules in cold water have more kinetic energy this is not correct the molecules in warm water are closer together no so it's a question 23 says four students a b c and d investigate the diffraction of water waves through a gap each student uses a different gap size and a different wavelength for the water waves which study produces the waves which have the most diffraction most diffraction happens when the wavelength is almost equal to the size of the gap so we have 2 and 1.8 that's pretty close 3 and 2.1 that's further 4 and 2 further 5 and 0.9 much further so it's a uh, the wavelength is almost equal to the gap size question 24 says the diagrams show examples of wave motion uh, we have uh, waves on water waves in air that sound wave uh, coming from a drum waves on a rope and waves in a spring and which waves are longitudinal uh, water waves are transverse sound wave is a longitudinal wave and this is made of compressions and rarefactions so it is also a longitudinal wave this is transverse so we have two transverse and these are longitudinal so it's two and four only which gives the answer to be d in question 25 we have uh, which diagram shows how the light from a candle is reflected by a mirror and shows the position of the image formed uh, in the mirror so basically the image is always in front of the object at the same distance so a is correct b is also correct we will check c and d no c and d are not correct the images are not in front of the object uh, for a the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection for b it is not equal this is the normal not the reflected ray so this is wrong so the answer is a question 26 says a converging lens can be used as a magnifying glass uh, what will be the nature of the image the image uh, in this case is always virtual upright and magnified or enlarged which is d in this question 
Question 27 says uh, the wavelength of blue light changes from 4.7 times 10 to power negative 7 meters to 3.5 times 10 to power negative 7 meters as it passes from air to water. What is the speed of this light in water? So uh, we have uh, an equation for the, the refractive index. Refractive index equals speed in air over speed in medium, which is also equal to frequency multiplied by wavelength in air over frequency multiplied by wavelength in water. The frequency does not change during refraction. So we have the wavelength here against the speeds. So the speed of light in air, you should know it to be 3 times 10 to the power of 8. And the speed in the water, that's the required value. The wavelength in air was 4.7 times 10 to the power of negative 7. And the wavelength in water is 3.5 times 10 to the power of negative 7. We do cross multiplication. We multiply these. Then we divide by 4.7 times 10 to the power of negative 7. This gives us a value of 2.2 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Question 28 says the diagram shows compressions and rarefactions in air as the sound wave moves uh, from left to right. A quieter sound, lower amplitude, this means a uh, sound uh, of the same frequency is made. Same frequency means that the separation between the compressions and rarefactions will stay the same. What will happen to the number of particles in a region of rarefaction and in a region of a compression so a quieter sound would not push the molecules uh, um, as much as a loud sound so the compression would not be filled with molecules the compression uh, will not be highly compressed and rarefaction will not be completely empty so uh, a, a rarefaction would contain more molecules in it because uh, it is not completely evacuated it's a it's a quiet sound it would not push the molecules away from a rarefaction and the compression would actually have less molecules since a quiet sound would not push more molecules into a compression so the answer is c question 29 says the diagrams show three different metal rods p q and r inside coils of wire small iron nails are placed on a wooden bench under the rods Diagram 1 shows the situation when uh, there are electric currents in the wires. Diagram 2 shows the situation when the currents are switched off. So the all have currents, so they are all electromagnets. But apparently P is not uh, a magnetic material, so it did not create a large magnetic field enough to attract the nails. But Q and R are magnetic materials. And after switching off the current, uh, the nails attracted to Q are no longer attracted, which means this is a soft magnetic material, but the nails attracted to R are kept uh, attracted, so this is a hard magnetic material. This means we have a non-magnetic in P, which is copper, a magnetic soft magnetic material, which is soft iron in Q, and a hard magnetic material, which is steel, so the answer is A. Question 30 says, which row describes conventional current and electron flow in a circuit containing a cell? If we have an electric cell in a circuit connected to a lamp, say, the conventional current moves out of the positive terminal and the electrons go out of the negative terminal. So for conventional current, from negative, no, from negative, no. These are the correct statements. In electron flow, it's from the negative terminal, yes, from the negative terminal, yes. So these are the correct statements. Combining them, we get C. Question 31 says a student makes four resistors using different pieces of wire. The wires have different diameters and length. All the pieces of wire are made of the same material. Which piece of wire will make the resistance with the largest resistance? So resistance proportional to the length and inversely proportional to the area. Same with diameter. So to increase resistance, we need to increase length and decrease diameter. So the longest length and the smallest diameter, this gives us B. Question 32 says a student is to determine the resistance of resistor R. She uses a circuit including a voltmeter and an ammeter. Which circuit should be used? Uh, voltmeters are always connected in parallel and ammeters are always connected in series. 
in A both are connected in series in B both are connected in parallel C we have voltmeter in series and then a meter in parallel this is wrong so the answer is D question 33 says the diagram shows a battery connected to two resistors 3 m meters m1 m2 and m3 are connected in the circuit a meter m1 reads 1 ampere uh, what are the readings on m2 and m3 since this circuit is all in series there are no branches whatsoever so all ammeters should read the same current so we have a meter uh, 3 reading 1 and this is also reading 1 so it's D question 34 says a cell is connected to a parallel combination of 2 ohm resistor and a 4 ohm resistor the current in the 4 ohm resistor is 1 ampere what is the current in the cell so the current in the cell, uh, if we call it I and this is I1 and this is I2, I should be equal to I1 plus I2. And since the current in uh, any circuit is inversely proportional to the resistance for the same voltage, uh, from the 4 ohm resistor to the 2 ohm resistor, the resistance was divided by 2, so the current should be multiplied by 2. So down there the current is 1 ampere the current here should be 2 amperes if we add 1 plus 2 we get 3 amperes so the answer is d question 35 is about logic gates which was removed from the syllabus uh, this year so you can skip this uh, question for now but i will solve it anyway the two inputs of uh, nand gate are joined together this creates something called a not gate and the NOT gate reverses the input. So if the input is 0, the output is 1. If the input is 1, the output is 0, which is B in this case. Question 36 says the diagram shows a transformer that has an output voltage of 12 volts. This is a secondary voltage and the primary voltage is 240 volts. The primary coil has 1000 turns and the secondary coil, uh, we need to know the number of turns on the secondary coil. So we have an equation. Vs over Vp, secondary over primary voltages, uh, equals Ns over Np. By substituting with the numbers we have, we have 12 over 240 equals Ns, which is required, over 1000 turns. We cross multiply, we calculate 1000 times 12 over 240, so we get 50 turns. Question 37 says the diagrams show different particles moving through a magnetic field. Which particle experiences a magnetic force acting up out of the plane of the paper? Out of the plane of the paper means uh, coming out of the screen. Uh, in this case, a magnetic force on a charged particle should be in the case of the particle moving perpendicular to the field. So A and B cannot be correct since the proton and electron are moving parallel to the field. Uh, now for C and D, they are both moving perpendicular to the field. A proton is positively charged, so the current would be in the same direction and the magnetic field is to the right. For an electron, the current would be moving upwards. Current is always opposite to a negative charge and the magnetic field here is also directed to the right. Now we try Fleming's left-hand rule with C. We have magnetic field to the right, so the index finger uh, uh, towards the right, and the middle finger representing the current downwards, so the thumb is actually pointing out of the page or, or out of the screen, so the answer is C. Question 38 says, when Rutherford bombarded thin gold foil with alpha particles, he found that some alpha particles were deflected through large angles. Which statement explains this deflection? Most of the atom consists of empty space, no. This is the uh, conclusion of that most of alpha particles passed undeflected through the atoms. Uh, B says all of the positive charge and most of the mass of the gold atom are concentrated in a small volume. This is actually correct. C says positive charge in the gold atom is spread evenly. No, they are concentrated in the nucleus. All of the negative charge is concentrated at its center. No positive charge since the nucleus is positively charged due to the protons question 39 says the diagram shows the path followed by alpha particles as they pass between two charged plates they are deflected downwards what happens to beta particles which are uh, oppositely charged to the alpha alpha is positively charged beta is negatively charged so beta would move towards the positively charged 
plate passing through the same electric field they are deflected downwards no they are deflected upwards yes they are not deflected no gamma rays are not deflected they are deflected downwards no again so it's b question 40 says the graph shows the count rate from a radioactive source over a period of time it says count rate on the y-axis against time on the x-axis what is the half-life of the source without any mention to background radiation this means we just take the highest value on the graph and then divide it by two so we get 1000 and we go to the line of the graph to find the time here which is one hour so the answer is b so this is the end of uh, the exam i hope you do well in your uh, final exams and i will see you in the next video